read these words together from Isaiah 6, verses 8, and, uh, 8 through 10. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go, and say to these people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This thing slow as I am. <laughs> Let's sing How I Love Jesus.
Father, we are thankful that we can come before your throne together as family of God. We can worship you. We can study your word together. Or as I've wrestled with this word this week, Lord, even sing my own, sing my own sin in it, Lord. I, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. And I thank you, Lord, that Lord, you are the one that deserves all glory and praise. And so we want to give it to you. Lord, you died for us. You've given us eternal life by your obedience to the commandment from the Father. So may our hearts be set on you alone. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I'm going to ask you a question. It's a, it's a very important question. Do you believe God? Yes. Do you, do you take him at his word? That's good. Because God's word is, is through him, right? He's breathed it out for us. And so we have God's word. It's from him. It's useful. It's useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. God's Word tells us that. 2 Timothy 3.16 And so as we come to God's Word, we need to come to it with open hearts and with open minds, with open eyes and with open ears, and let him speak to us. If we come to God's word in a manner that says, I want to argue with God, there's no way to come to God's word. And so I invite you to be turning in God's word to John chapter 12. We'll start there in verse 37. But as we, as we come to that, we find a group of people here that, well, they did not. They did not believe God's word. And so, in their disbelief, I'm going to just take this off and I'm going to talk loud. Are y'all okay with that? Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right. I'm just going to talk loud. Y'all hear me? Everybody hear me? All right. Good. Because no one needs to be distracted from the Word of God. Our attention needs to be on God's Word. And so, as our attention and as our focus is on the Word of God this morning, I want us to be reminded that there's a... A group of people that it talks about right here as we get into this verse is that they did not believe. What did they not believe? Well, they didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't believe the word of God. They had their own ideas about God's word. And they wanted to put God into their little box. He had to fit inside their box of what, who they thought God is. And so they ignored him. They ignored his miracles because they wanted somebody to come and they wanted somebody to come and they wanted somebody to rule and to beat out the Romans and to help them. But what they needed, what the greatest need they had in their hearts was their sin. And so they needed Jesus, but yet they rejected the idea that he would be lifted up. They didn't believe. They didn't believe who Jesus was, even though many signs had been done before. And so these same people that came in shouting, Hosanna, save us, Lord, have turned away from Jesus. They've turned away from the God of the universe because they had their own idea about who he is. So as we come to God's word, let's come with open hearts and with open minds. And let him speak to us so that we may be healed. Picking up in verse 37, reading through verse 50, John chapter 12. Though he had done many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their ears and he has hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn. And I will heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken out of my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. So what I say, therefore, I say, as the Father has told me. You know, as so I get into this passage, I do, I have to admit that I've really wrestled with it. And it's been a, a passage for me to spend a lot of time with it. I enjoy wrestling through passages because there's a lot of hard truths in this passage. And I think we need to hear them. This is such a hard passage that Pastor Chris was showing me in the book that he's been using that helped him as preaching through the scriptures. They completely ignored this passage. They just skipped over it all together. They didn't even have a commentary section on it. And multiple commentators that I've read, they all have different viewpoints. And so that's why I want us to come to this and ask you, do you believe God? Do you take him at his word? Do you believe what is so said and spoken right here? Do you believe it? Are you able to take it and apply it to your life? I trust for many of you that's true. But doesn't it just baffle us, those who don't believe? I mean, I am completely baffled by it. I really am. Got to wake to the sound of thunder this morning. <coughs> and then I get to go out and I get to see this amazing creation that God has, has that is trillions of light years across the span. Stuff that we can't even count, we can't even fathom. And he spoke and it happened. Wow! I mean, and, and yet, you got people that go out and they want to say that he didn't make us, that he didn't make this creation. Why? They're blind. They're blind. They're hard-hearted. Their ears won't hear. And so, they have no belief. They have no faith in who Jesus is. And so there are blind people that are spoken about in Scripture too. Jesus talks to us about how the Pharisees are blind. How they're blind guides. They're leading people to the pit. How are they doing that? By adding to the Word of God. Adding to the Word of God. Law. That doesn't need to be there because God's law is sufficient. We don't need to have extra laws. We do need to hear the Word of God and respond to the Word of God with repentance. And so we don't need to fear those in any way, shape, form, or fashion. But God does call us to believe. And there will be some that who do not believe. And we don't need to be baffled by their unbelief. 
But what we do need to do is proclaim the truth of who he says he is and trust his word at the proclamation of that truth. Because what did Isaiah say in this passage that is quoted right here? He's blinded their eyes, he's hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn and I would heal them. That's from the word of God. And so after he, God showed that to Isaiah, after saying, I'm going to send you. And so he sends us out to amongst the people that he says, narrow is the gate. Broad is the path that leads to destruction. Well, what are we to do? Proclaim his word. Act in obedience to him because we believe his word. I could try to come to his word and argue with his word and say, what? Well, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say he blinded their eyes. It doesn't say he hardened their hearts. It doesn't say that, but it does. How did it happen? Well, sin. Sin entered into the world and sin blinds. And so God did not illuminate their eyes to see and respond because he is the one that acts in saving grace. And we could come to this passage and try to argue with that and say, oh, I don't think it says that. It does. Let's take the word of God as the word of God. And I've had people ask me in the past, do you, are you a Calvinist? And I, to them, I say, I've never actually read a book by John Calvin. I have. I, I, but I've read the Bible through many times. And I believe God's word. I believe his word when he says he's blinded their eyes and he's hardened their hearts so as they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. I believe his word there. But I also believe his word that he says he, believes, he desires that none should perish but all should come to everlasting life. I believe his word. I believe his word when he, and whenever I read through the gospel of John and some 120 times it asks us to believe and then the whole purpose of the book, as John tells us in John 20, 31, is so that you might believe. So I believe God's word. And I believe it was written to us so that we would turn and so that we would believe him. So that we would trust him. And not come to him and try to put him in any kind of box. Because here's the thing about God. He's not going to fit there. Do we have free will? Yes, we do. Is God completely sovereign? Yes, he is. How is that possible? Because he's big. He's so grand. Am I going to be able to fully explain that to you? No, I can't. It's a mystery. But it's one that the word of God proclaims. And it's one that we trust because it's proclaimed in the word of God. And Isaiah had spoken these things because he saw the glory of whom he spoke of. We see that in verse 41. And so in this glory, as we're talking about, we've read from one, he's in the throne room of God. And he's saying, who's going to go for us? Who will I send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. So he sees the glory of God. And how, what does he do at seeing the glory of God? He says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. Amongst the people of unclean lips. And so what happens? Well, something from the altar of God is taken to him, touches his lips, and brings about a cleansing. The altar of God is in, has been sacrificed once and for all for us, and we can be cleansed as we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And we have a cleansing that comes from him. Praise be to him. And as we see the glory that he spoke of, the other passage that is spoken up here, Lord, who has believed what they heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed that comes from Isaiah 53. And that is the point where we see Jesus as the suffering servant. See Jesus as the one who's by his stripes we are healed. He's pierced for our transgressions. And so who has believed what he heard? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? It's being revealed to us right now. God's word. We have it right here before us. We can read it. We can understand it. And we can live. 
and we can live forever. So we have that first group of people here that we see that though many signs have been done before them, they still did not believe. So they did not believe. And that's the majority of people here. Not here, in, in this text. I'm not speaking about this room. But that's the majority of people in the world, too. We got about 8 billion of us. Any stats will tell us that on a, a, a really good flattering stat for the church will say 2 billion are followers of Jesus. At least 6 billion other people who are walking in blindness. <laughs> And so it's our responsibility to take that message and allow God to work in their hearts and in their lives and trust that He will and leave it to Him and proclaim from the, on the rooftops, on the mountaintops, everywhere what He has asked us to proclaim. And so that's that first group of people. Here, there's these that saw the signs but they did not believe. But then there's another group of people here. And it says, nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue. Why? For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. So as I was working through this passage, that verse 42 stood out to me first. It did, as I just read the whole passage all together, verse 42 stood out to me. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. For fear of man. Man! And why? Were they afraid of man? Well, they liked the glory that comes from man. So they wouldn't stand up to man. And they wouldn't proclaim the truth of God's word, at least at this point that we see. But what we do see is it says that they believed in him. So what's going on here? Well, through some of the commentaries and things that I read, I had to pass along to me that, that John Piper said, well, their faith is flawed. I agree with that statement. So is John Piper's. So is mine. So is Lacey's. So is Pastor Chris's. So is the guys up in the booth. So is everybody that was singing up here. We have a flawed faith. We do. In many ways. But guess what we get to do? We get to take our faith and put it toward the author and perfecter of our faith and trust that he will perfect our faith. When we come to Jesus, we come with many flaws. You don't have to come to Jesus fitting in this tight little box of faith. You come to Jesus and say, I believe that you died for my sins and you rose on the third day. And in that confession, confessing Him as Lord over your life, He gives you a new life. He gives you the Holy Spirit. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, He convicts you of your sin. And then we're able to turn and confess that sin and be healed and cleansed from all unrighteousness. You know, as I was working through this, I, I, I couldn't help but think of my brothers and sisters overseas who endure things that we cannot fathom because of their faith in Jesus. And so, even in seminary, we had to create this classification for people as in a gauge of where their belief was in Jesus. And so we call it C1 to C5. 
So my, in my master's is in international church planning. So we had a class called contextualization, and that's where I was able to study this. And so you have these C1 believers, and they would be much like us. They would be at, at going out and worshiping the Lord publicly and professing Him before all, no matter what the consequence is. It's easy to see them as believers. And then there, there was another classification that was C2. And often the C2 believers... Well, they would still worship the Lord, but there might be somebody in their, in their path, in their life, that doesn't know them as a follower of Jesus yet. But we trust that God's going to bring to the light what is in the darkness. And then there's people from C3 where, where I was. You know, the classification there would be maybe they would still celebrate some type of Muslim holiday, but they would profess Jesus as Lord and they proclaimed him, and they would still go, and they would worship together with their brothers and sisters, but often it would be in secret for fear of the authorities. They were afraid they would be killed for their faith. And in what, at times whenever I would have to give people a lesson on baptism, it's so much different than here. Whenever I give a lesson on baptism here, what I tell people is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab your nose and I'm going to put you down. And I'm going to say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's the lesson that I would give. Now, we would want them to proclaim their testimony and show that they're followers of Jesus before we did that. But in the lesson on baptism that I would do overseas, I would have to say, you're about to sign your life away. You're no longer going to have your children be able to go to school anymore. Because you're going to have to write on a certificate there that you're a baptized believer in Jesus Christ in a country that's a Muslim majority. So you're not going to be able to do that anymore. You don't have your kids go to school. Whenever you die, there's not going to be a place you can be buried. Because there's no graveyard for you to be buried in. And so you have to be cremated like the Hindus are. And they didn't want to have that. You might not be able to go shop. You might not be able to go eat. And I would tell them this, but yet they would still openly profess Jesus as their Lord and Savior and be baptized. Praise the Lord. Then there was another group that we would speak of, and they were the C4 and C5, and often you would consider them not to be believers because they didn't profess faith, really. The C5 believer, you didn't even know that they were a believer. They just maybe watched the Billy Graham conference on TV, and they responded in their heart, and they never told anybody, ever, that they had that response time, ever. And so nothing outwardly was ever professed by them. And the C4 believer would still go to the mosque and still worship in those ways, but they might go out with somebody like me or help somebody like me with language and study the Word, but they would keep it secret from their family, from their friends, from everybody else. So these are things we had to wrestle with. But as I wrestle with this text, what I see is it says they believed. And so I don't argue with that because the Word of God says it. And so I don't know how these authorities responded after the day of Pentecost. I don't, I don't have an example there. I don't know how these authorities responded after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't have an example there. But I do see in the text that it says they believe, so I, I believe the Word of God. And I cling to that. And I trust it. So is their faith flawed? Yes, it is. So as many of ours. You know, I, I stand here today, I told the, told the men in my group this morning, I said, I got some sin I'm going to confess today in the church service. And I tr trust that the church will respond. And so as I come to this text, I'm going to just point the finger at myself first. Come to verse 43. For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And I'll say that there have been times in my ministry here that instead of first seeking the glory of God, I just wanted people to like me. And so I went against how God has made me to be. And I just did something to please man whether it was singing a song 
or having an activity or singing in a style that I wasn't accustomed to singing in just to please man. And it broke my heart that I tried to please man instead of God. And so, church family, I'm here right now and I'm confessing that to you. <laughs> that there are times that I would intentionally sing a song or I would intentionally plan an activity and it wasn't to the glory of God. It was just to make a person happy or a group of people happy. And I'm sorry. And in response, I want to ask you, will you respond to me? As I ask for your forgiveness, I'm going to ask you to respond by saying amen. 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 Thank you, church family. <laughs> Opposed like sign. The amen's happen. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Let that be an example to us all. That we can take whatever sin we have and take it out of the darkness and bring it to the light. We can receive grace. We receive forgiveness. Because that's who we are as a church family. We're people who forgive one another. Thank you. And know that the same can be done for you. So if you've had action where you're just trying to please man instead of God, take it out of the darkness and bring it to the light. If you have a sin in your life and you're afraid of what man may think about it, take it out of the darkness and bring it to the light. Because of this group that I'm talking about right here, those who would not confess, Jesus gives the remedy right in the very next verses. And he said, Jesus cried out, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in whom who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. And I have come into the world as a light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. <clears throat> so if you believe in Jesus, take whatever is in your life, that is in darkness and bring it to the light of Christ. And here's what happens. It gives glory to God. It gives glory to God. That's what happens. God is glorified whenever we confess our sin and we receive <clears throat> forgiveness. And that's what it's going to be like for eternity. Get that. God's light's going to shine on us and we're going to shine back to Him, giving Him glory. It's going to illuminate off our foreheads. That's what the picture is that we have in Revelation of the eternal kingdom. We're going to constantly be giving glory back to God. And so what do we pray? We pray that God's kingdom be done on earth as it is in heaven. So let it start with us now. Let us take whatever sin we have in the darkness, bring it into the light, and let it shine off of us and give Him glory. Because He deserves it. And he alone deserves it. I'm so sad that there's been pastors I've encountered in my life and others that they've just been afraid to speak because of fear of man. And they like the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They'd be afraid to speak about the president. They'd be afraid to speak about a sin. I've had pastors come to me and be like, you know, I really want to talk to this person about the sin that's in their life, but I think they give a lot. I can think in that they're rich. So there's the love of man, the glory that comes from man, and money. And they're held in snares <coughs> for loving the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And the cure for it is taking that out of the darkness and bringing it to the light. And church family, when we do it, you receive forgiveness from one another. Just as I received forgiveness from you this morning, the same happens in all of our lives. We get to receive forgiveness.
So as we talk about this group that they didn't believe, are they, and then the group that did believe, we do need to compare that with all the scripture. We do. And so I, I want us to see that it is sin because Jesus says in Matthew 10, 33, whoever denies me before me and I will also deny him before my father who is in heaven. And in that context, in, in chapter 10, he's saying, don't have fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. And what I tell you in the dark, say in the light, when you hear whisper, proclaim on the house type, do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Don't fear man. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the Father. But even the hairs on your head are numbered. So fear not, therefore. You are more valuable than the sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. And so if we have that sin in our life, life what do we do we take it out of the darkness we bring it into the light and Jesus helps us with that we can see a clear example of this denial in the person of Peter right Jesus was denied by Peter <coughs> and a rooster crowed and Peter broke down in broken heartedness over his sin and Jesus restored him Jesus restored him. And he went and he proclaimed the name of Jesus even to his death. But guess what? He even fell back into the trap again. He did. He fell back into the trap again of wanting glory that came from man instead of the glory that comes from God. And so what happened? Paul opposed him. So you come to Galatians 2. And see in verse 11, but... Cephas came to Antioch and I opposed him face to face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came in, he drew back and separating himself, fearing the circumcision party. He feared man, but praise be to God, he sent another man into his life to call him out on his sin and then. He's going to be restored yet again. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically in verse 13 there, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct, I was not in step with that was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas before them all. If you, therefore, a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth. Not Gentile sinners. We are. I'm talking about Paul. <coughs> Yet, we know the person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, so that we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. We are only justified by the work of Christ that takes place in our lives. And because of the work of Christ, we know that we can come before Him. And we know we can confess our sins and that we will be forgiven. As I said, picking up in verse 48 of John chapter 12, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. What are we going to be judged by, church family? The Word of God. How we live in accordance to the Word of God. So you heard me quote John Piper earlier. You're not going to be judged by his words. You're not going to be judged by the words of John MacArthur. You're not going to be word judged by the words of John Stott. You're not going to be word judged by the words of John Brown. Not by the words of John it, John Hagee, John, any John out there, John Calvin, whoever it may be. You know, be judged by the words of John Bell right now. 
You're not going to be judged by the words of John Christensen. You're not going to be judged by the words of John Kennedy or John C. Calhoun. But you will be judged by the words that are written by the Apostle John by the power of the Holy Spirit. You will be judged by those and in accordance with them. And in your response of faith before the throne of God, did you believe in Jesus? Did you? Or was it all about you? It's a question that we have to ask in our own hearts. Because there was certainly a time in this country when it was beneficial to proclaim Jesus. It's not that way anymore. But is it in your own heart? Or is it just for the glory of man? Is it to the glory of God that you believe? Or do you like the praise that comes from men more than the praise that comes from God? Because we will be judged by God's Word. I got about 150 books on my bookshelf and I got about a thousand in a digital library because you can't take books with you overseas. But I'm not going to be judged by any single one of those books on my bookshelf except for 12 of them. And they'll call all 12 of those books are the Word of God. They're in several different translations. The King James, the New King James, the Christian Standard Bible, the English Standard Bible, the, the Holy Christian Standard Bible, the NIV 84, all kinds of translations there. Whether it says thee or thou or you or them, they're the Word of God. And every one of those that I just said to you are ones that have been directly translated from Greek and Hebrew into our language that we can read it today so that we will believe. And they've been passed down for over 2,000 years. They stood the test of time. So do we believe those words? Do we hold to them in truth? Or do we have to have something else? Or somebody else? We don't. We need God alone. And we want to give glory to Him alone. And Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me himself has given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. And I know his commandment is eternal life. So one of those 120 believes that are in this book right here that we have in, the, in John, the pseudo there that is Greek is translated into, into belief is you guys know it very well. For God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believed in Him would not perish but have eternal life. And so when it says whosoever, I believe that. I do. And so what does it mean to believe? It means to put your faith in. Put your faith in Jesus. Give your life to Him. Die to yourself. Say, I don't matter anymore. Jesus is who matters. Because to put your faith in something is not just a mental thought. We've talked about this before. I've told many of you, and I'm still going to keep telling you, I want to go skydiving. I really do. Because it's just something fun. I'm going to wait until Jenny Ruth's grown up, is what Lacey's told me. So once Jenny Ruth's out of the house, then I can go skydiving. She don't care if I die from an airplane then. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I do. I want to go skydiving. But here's the thing I can tell you. I can tell that guy that's going to help me jump out of that plane. I believe all the time that that parachute will open when I jump out of that plane. But I never put my faith in that parachute until I jump out of the plane. You never put your faith in Jesus until you die to yourself. <coughs> live for him alone. Don't live for the glory of man. Goodness. For one thing, man can't handle it. It's not made for us. The Hebrew understanding of the word glory is heavy. It's heavy. It's a weight. It's a bearing that we cannot take. It has to all be given to God. So what has to be given to God? Our praise, our confessions, everything has to be given to Him. Now you guys know I worked in entertainment and I can tell you by working in entertainment that man does not need glory. It just weighs them down and makes them miserable. That's what it does. 
That's why we have kids right and left today that are miserable because they just live for the life on their social media account. And some of us as well just live for that life on the social media account rather than living to the glory of God alone. We got people that won't speak truth about the word of God because they want some other group of people to like them. It happens in churches all over where they say, well, God, did God really say that first question that's a lie? It's been asked still. It still keeps getting asked all the time. Did God really say that marriage between a man and a woman? Yes, he did. Did God really say that drunkenness quenches the Holy Spirit? Yes, he did. Did God really say we shouldn't take his name in vain? Yes, he did. Did God really say we shouldn't give glory to man? <coughs> yes, he did. Because it's his alone. <coughs> God really said. And that's why we studied the whole Bible last year as a church family so we could have the whole counsel of God. But Jesus acted in obedience to the Father. The Father who sent him so that we could have eternal life. He acted in obedience. And he said, Not my will, but yours be done. So are we able to say that? Not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus, who is tempted in every way that we are, yet never given in to sin, always acted on the will of the Father. He's endured everything. And so we know that we have an author and perfecter of our faith that we can come to and we can trust that he does give us forgiveness when we will bring that to him. And the commandment that he obeyed does give us eternal life. Because in his death for our sins, we have a great resurrection that we get to celebrate. <laughs> so in that resurrection, we get to live and we get to live there forever because our sins are in the grave. And they stay there forever. They do not have power over us anymore. And they lose their power when we take them out of the darkness and we bring them to the light. So do you believe God? Do you believe his word? Do you believe the word that he has spoken? Do you believe what's written here in John chapter 12, verse 37 through 50? We should therefore do as the Father has commanded us and live before his throne in righteousness. Not for man, but to his glory alone. Thank you for your grace. Now, thank you, church family, for your love and your kindness. And I love you. And so it's my prayer, as I pray now, that God will change our hearts. And that we'll live only to his glory alone. And that he will root out all unrighteousness within us, seeking to please man. Father, I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that your word gives us life. I'm thankful that we can come before your word and we can trust your word and we can have eternal life. I'm thankful that you obeyed the Father's commands. And in your obedience, Lord, you have given us that gift of eternal life which come through your death and burial and resurrection. Though you could call down legions of angels, you chose not to. But we say thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you for the love that you've shown to us. And Lord, though we don't fully understand, there's some of scripture that is yet still a mystery to us. We trust your word. And Lord, we trust you. And we trust, Lord, that when you tell us to take sin out of the darkness and bring it to the light. That forgiveness is available. We believe you. We believe you that we can come before your throne of grace. We believe you that we can pray for one another. And we believe you that man has no power over our lives. And we should not fear man. Because you care for the sparrow, you know every one of the hairs on our heads. 
So thank you, Lord, that we have that freedom. Oh, how sweet it is. And so, Lord, as we go and we're able to tell the story of how you saved us, how you redeemed the world, we can love in telling that. We can give you all praise and thanksgiving as we tell the sweet story of how you love us. And Lord, when people respond and they come out of darkness into light, we can say thank you, Lord, that you have given them sight. That you helped them to hear the words. Thank you for sending us to proclaim them. That you would choose us to walk in obedience before your throne so that we might be a people set apart holy for you. And so as those that are here today, if somebody needs to respond and say, I believe, Lord, I pray that you press that upon their heart, that they would, would respond because you desire them to do so. If there's somebody that needs to confess a sin, the altar is open. Let them come and confess. Thank you, Lord, for your grace. Thank you for the grace of your people who are the church. Thank you that we love one another and we show that. And Lord, thank you that that is how we show who you are. And you're known by our love for one another. So as we praise you now, we're reminded how we love to tell this story. May you receive all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you stand with us and sing together, I love to tell the story.
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. Love, sir. Thank you.